As great power competition is now the main focus of the military, more is being done to secure US assets in space. Now considered a warfighting domain, space is getting far more attention than it used to. More weapons exist today than at any other time which are meant to neutralize the benefits that the US now enjoys both militarily and economically due to its dominance in space. These weapons are becoming cheaper and easier to obtain for our adversaries. So in this episode of Learning Military, we're going to take a look at the different kinds of weapons that can be leveraged to fight in space. This episode will lay the foundation for a future episode regarding the Space Force itself. As usual, I've collected information from government publications, congressional reports, academic research, and articles from various experts to piece this together for you. But before I begin, I want to remind everybody that in the description below, you will find a link to Patreon. Your guys' financial contribution will help this channel grow and provide some additional research opportunities to provide some even cooler information than what I'm going to be providing to you in this episode. Also, since this is a YouTube channel, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. Remember, the next episode is going to be about the Space Force, so I definitely recommend that you subscribe and hit the bell icon so you know when that episode comes out. If there is something in here that you think is cool that somebody else would enjoy, please consider sharing this video okay so back to it one thing that is important to note is that weapons can be used against space assets are really more widely available than most people think and encompass far more than i think a number of people expect too the most common description of a weapon against space assets it's usually something that will destroy a satellite as we'll come to find out through this episode there is much more to space warfare than just destroying satellites the Defense Intelligence Agency categorized threats to U.S. space assets into four different categories. These categories are kinetic physical, non-kinetic physical, electronic, and cyber. So let's talk about these different categories in some detail to understand the kinds of weapons that exist. Since I talked about it a second ago as the most commonly thought of anti-satellite weapons, let's discuss kinetic physical weapons. So this first category is the most destructive types of weapons that we're going to talk about because really the whole premise behind them is the destruction of an asset by striking it with a physical object, sometimes the weapon itself. For example, one of the weapons that fall into this category is a direct ascent anti-satellite weapon, which is fired so it will impact a satellite in flight. The four nations that have shown the capability of having such weapons are the United States, Russia, China, and India. Though some ballistic missiles and missile defense systems could be modified to act as an anti-satellite weapon, this area encompasses some of the earliest anti-satellite weapons. Again, you're going to find a wide variety of weapons within this area that can accomplish the task of striking an asset with a physical object. For example, the United States developed the ASM-135 missile and it successfully was fired from an F-15 in 1985. In this test, it successfully struck a satellite. So being able to shoot down a satellite from an F-15 shows the flexibility of weapons that can exist in this area. Another example of kinetic physical weapons is a co-orbital anti-satellite weapon, which means something that is already in orbit but maneuvers itself to strike another satellite while in orbit. These two types of weapons are difficult to successfully employ due to the high cost and technology needed to create such a weapon with this kind of precision. In addition, these weapons are usually the most frowned upon in the international community as a successful strike will completely destroy a satellite and send thousands of small pieces of debris into orbit. China, for example, faced international criticism after an anti-satellite test in 2007 where it destroyed one of their own satellites and sent more than 3,000 pieces of debris into orbit. To understand the full breadth of vulnerability that exists in our space infrastructure, it's important to understand that you don't necessarily need to hit a satellite in orbit to count as having a physical kinetic weapon that can disrupt space assets. The Defense Intelligence Agency lists attacking ground stations as a kinetic physical weapon that can be used. Whether through an airstrike or some other means, destruction of ground assets and stations that communicate with the satellites is an important attack vector that should be considered. For many adversaries, hitting a ground station is much easier than hitting a target in space. The second category, non-kinetic physical weapons, is an area where we are seeing more threats emerge. Some of the most extreme versions of non-kinetic physical weapons are nuclear weapons detonated in orbit and electromagnetic pulse weapons. Just like some of the kinetic physical weapons that we talked about earlier, these two are frowned upon because of the indiscriminate effect on other satellites in orbit and the long-lasting impact that they can have in space. 
Unfortunately, few nations have these kind of capabilities. However, lasers and high-powered microwave emissions are considered non-kinetic physical weapons as well. And high-energy lasers can degrade or destroy critical parts of a satellite like solar panels, or they can dazzle or blind a satellite by using a laser too. It's this blinding of a satellite that is becoming more common, and it makes sense. You are still disabling a satellite, but it's not permanent and it won't cause issues for other satellites. Because of this kind of scenario where you can disable a satellite at will and potentially re-enable its functionality at a later time, this is an area where we're seeing a lot more adversaries or challengers starting to employ non-kinetic physical weapons in space. As we look into the third area, electronics, it's important to also note here that this category specifically deals with radio frequency transmissions between the ground and space. Unlike the aforementioned categories, many of the weapons in this category are commercially available. For example, jamming and spoofing of satellite signals are considered an electronic weapon. Since spoofing has become much easier, this technology has proliferated to state and non-state actors alike. Even today, we are seeing electronic jamming happening regularly. Right now, Iran is being accused of utilizing GPS jamming near the Strait of Hormuz to make aircraft and ships accidentally cross into Iranian territory, thus justifying the seizure of those ships. Spoofing of communications and jamming of GPS and other satellite-enabled technologies has been reported in that area for some time. I feel like I should really stress the importance of this area in space weaponry, particularly with the kind of impact that electronic weapons can have on the United States military. If we look at GPS jamming, for example, one of the most easy weapons to acquire, this has the potential to negate smart weapons, blue force tracking, and obviously guidance for air, naval, and land forces. Not having those capabilities would significantly change the way that the United States would need to fight in a great power struggle. Now, it's important to note, too, that electronic weapons can take place at two stages. It can impact the uplink, which is signal sent from the Earth to the satellite, or during the downlink, which is from the satellite to the Earth. Each aspect of this can have its own unique issues. For example, if someone can spoof the uplink, meaning it to imitate, that person can give commands to the satellite which can damage or disable it permanently. The final kind of weapon that we're going to discuss in this video that can be used against our space assets is cyber weapons. Now this likely is the easiest to understand since cyber is a domain that we are all pretty familiar with. With cyber weapons, you don't necessarily need to gain entry into the systems of the satellite itself. You can also attack the ground control systems as well, like we discussed with the kinetic physical weapons. A successful cyber attack not only can allow for direct control of the space asset to give commands to it, but it can also be used to monitor and potentially even alter the information in the uplink or downlink. All four of these kinds of weapons currently pose a threat to the United States assets in space. In the near future, there may be new weapons that are developed that fall into these four categories, but the real issue is that there are going to be more nations that can employ these types of weapons, and that there are going to be more weapons just in general that can be used against our satellites. To compensate for this, we are likely going to see a rapid militarization of space and an increase in defensive strategies for satellites. Right now, satellites are extremely vulnerable to the four areas that we discuss, and in a lot of cases, there is a single highly sensitive and powerful satellite that performs a single task. This means that there is no redundancy or backup in the event that that satellite goes down. These defensive strategies can range from doing what France's defense minister suggested of using cameras, machine guns, and lasers on sensitive satellites to look out for threats, to the other option, which is to fight back by creating a constellation of satellites that perform a similar function and are easy to replace. Maybe it's better to have a number of satellites that can do a job well, rather than having a single satellite that can do a particular job great. One of the things that restricts the weaponization of space is the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. While this treaty encompasses a number of things, a major component of the treaty is the prevention of placing weapons of mass destruction in Earth orbit or anywhere in space. While important, conventional weapons are still allowed under this treaty. 
There have been some attempts to try and get international law created that further prohibits the weaponization of space, but this too can be problematic. Many of the technologies that can be used for peaceful purposes can also have military applications as well. Take for example the issue that exists in space with space junk. The technology exists where a satellite in orbit can intercept a dead satellite and deorbit it, basically making it fall to the earth, clearing the way for a new satellite. While such technology should be employed, the problem remains that such an application could also be applied to deorbit active and critical satellites from a hostile nation, so there will really be no way that we can fully de-weaponize space. Since we will likely see the continued militarization of space, an increase in the complexity and number of weapons which challenge US assets, there is going to be a need for a space force. And we're going to talk about the space force in the next episode. So remember to subscribe and hit the bell icon so you can come back for that episode. Since we've laid down the framework of the types of weapons that exist, I hope you've learned a little bit more. Also comment and let me know if there was anything here that you learned. I love being able to see that stuff. And I know that other people will get some great information from your guys' comments as well. Thanks again for watching the Learning Military channel. I appreciate it. Until the next video, I got your six.